Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program... The Resistance. The Resistance is strong with me. And yet we soldier on. Yes, we are solo soding once again because we gotta talk about Neil Peart. And we gotta talk about The Come Down. And we gotta talk about music. But we'll get to all of that. Right now, there's only one thing we gotta do. And do you know what it is, Denny boy? We got a roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, podcast people. I want you to know, this is very important, and I think a lot of you will be pleased when you hear that today I have pants on. I was going to do this in my shorts, but I thought, no. We need a modicum of professional presentation. And, you know, sometimes the clothes make the man. So what I did here is I put on my black jeans and my cattle t-shirt. And now I feel like uh, some sort of a rock and roller rather than some dude in his shorts at home in his little studio. Now, you should also know that I got uh, the curtain open. And there's this great sort of orange glowing ball in the sky, which, uh, you know, if, if uh, memory of my youth serves me, I think that's the sun. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but it's got all the characteristics of the sun. It hurts when I look at it. Everything seems all aglow, and what a thought that is. The problem when you open your curtain to the sun is that you begin to see how filthy your windows are. And I suppose there's a certain amount of logic in that, given that I've lived here for something like 15 years and we've never actually cleaned the windows. So, you know, sometimes... The simplest answer is the correct one. That's Occam's razor. And windows are dirty because I never clean them. But I got my pants on, and I gotta tell ya, I'm experiencing the come down. Do you know about the come down, kids? Probably if you've been putting yourself out there, you know what the come down is. The come down is that feeling you get after you do a thing, and it's a brave thing and a courageous thing, and it takes a certain amount of courage to do it, and then you feel good, and then maybe the next day or two days later after that sort of uh, I did it high comes off, you experience the come down. And that's when your confidence and your enthusiasm plummet into the depths. And I'm experiencing the come down right now because I did a second solo sode that I released last week to some acclaim, and I appreciate that. And you would think that having done that, I would jump up immediately to do another one full of confidence and ready to take on that world, but in fact, the opposite tends to happen. When you step into uncharted territory, when you push through a fear boundary, it can take time for your confidence to rise up to that new level you've stepped into. Very often the opposite happens, where you withdraw from that and you become more scared and you probably fall victim to this imposter syndrome. Do you know about imposter syndrome? This is the idea that we sometimes get that we're faking it and we're not worthy of whatever accolade we have, and we're not qualified to do the thing we want to do. As a drummer, I've experienced this over and over and over again, where I step into a musical situation, 
tour or a recording session or whatever. And inside my head, I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. I, I don't know why this person has hired me to play this stuff or to do these uh, dates or whatever. I feel like an imposter putting myself into this situation. And that can be debilitating. Now, I've had imposter syndrome wreck me in a lot of ways over the years. I've talked about opportunities that I haven't taken because I felt like an imposter doing it. And I don't really know where imposter syndrome comes from. What I do know is that most people experience it at some point in their lives. I did a blog post one time that addresses this, and it's about becoming the sort of person who can. And the idea behind that is when you start something new, or when you step up into a higher level of what you're already doing, it can take time to become the sort of person who can handle that sort of weight. If you use a gym analogy, right, uh, you don't walk into a gym and bench press 300 pounds, typically, unless you're a freakish sort of strong person. Usually you walk in and you're not capable of the 300 club. You begin at the 100 club or the 50 pounds club or whatever, and you have to become the sort of person who can bench press 300 pounds. And that is through a series of stepping up, doing the work, putting in the time, developing the strength, the musculature, uh, the supporting ligaments, etc., the stabilizer muscles to be able to handle that kind of load. And you become a 300 pound bench presser. And that's also a mental thing. You have to develop the mental capacity to begin to see yourself as that. And, um, so it is with anything else. So it is with music, where you might be a club player, you might be a basement player, as I was at one point in time, still am. Uh, to move into being a club player is a change of identity, and it's a change of confidence, it's a change of mentality, and there are certain practical things that you need to be able to do in terms of experience to succeed at that level. And so you become the sort of person who can play club shows. And then maybe you get the chance to move up into theater shows and the responsibilities are a little bit bigger. The requirements are a little bit more strenuous. The required experience is bigger than the club shows, maybe. And so you become the sort of person who can play theater gigs and become the sort of person who can play thousand seaters and who can play 5,000 person festivals and then can play arenas or whatever. It's the same in studio work. It's the same in being an athlete. It's the same in being an artist. It's the same in being a podcaster. So you put out a solo sode like I did or two of them. And a voice that comes up inside you says, that was uh, scary. That put you in a place of vulnerability. And we don't like being in places of vulnerability as a species. I don't think any species does like being in a place of vulnerability. So when you do that and you push through that barrier, you can get an initial kind of rush, pun intended, of confidence and courage, and you kind of feed off that, you coast off that for a while, maybe a day, maybe two days, but then at some point, the come down happens, and that part of you that doesn't like to be vulnerable jumps up, grabs you by the heart, by the face, by the throat, pulls you back down, withdraws you back into a place of comfort, because it doesn't like to be afraid. And man, I've been hitting that hard since I released the last solo sode. Uh, the good thing is that I've developed enough experience and enough, dare I say it, wisdom to know that the only way to fight the come down is to climb back up again. And that involves the same damn process of pushing yourself back through the fear. So if you listen to the last solo sode 
back in the saddle, you'll know that I paced the floor for two hours before I came downstairs and actually hit record on the recorder. Because that's a vulnerable thing to do, and I do not feel qualified to do it. Why don't I feel qualified to do it? I don't know, because I've never done it. And, you know, you grow up with a certain amount of humility. You grow up with lessons that say, don't put yourself out there. And for crying out loud, as one voice talking in the night, what sort of ego do you have to have to do that sort of thing? This sort of stuff clangs around in my head all the time. And it stopped me from doing that last episode. But then I eventually worked up the courage to push through that, put the episode out, and felt really good. And the day I released it, I felt great. It felt like uh, like an accomplishment. And then a couple days later, thinking about the next episode, all those thoughts come right back in. Who are you to do this? What on earth are you offering that's of any value? And what is the point? And isn't it easier and safer to just not do that anymore? Yes, it is. But there's no growth in not doing the thing. So what do you do about that? Well, you screw up your courage again, and you pace the floor if you have to, and you put your pants on, and you get your cup of apple cider vinegar diluted in hot water. You come down to your little studio, and you press record, and you hope for the best. You make yourself vulnerable again, and hopefully you turn out a product, and then you release the product, and then you let go of the product, and a week or later, or 10 days, or whenever the next one comes along, you face that vulnerability again. The good news is that over time, the vulnerability becomes much more manageable. You become the sort of person who can do the thing. Right? So keep going, kids. Do not fear the come down. The come down is an illusion. Keep going. Keep trying. Now, we got to talk about Neil, okay? By now, of course, you will know that the great Neil Peart has passed away. And he did so as he lived, you know. He was a quiet, private genius, and he died privately and quietly. I don't think anybody knew about this brain cancer thing, and that is horrendous. Uh, we saw it much more publicly with Gord Downey and of the Tragically Hip, and that was a sad, sad thing. And we never got to have a cross-country celebration for Neil Peart, and I think that's precisely how he wanted it, which is why I don't think anything was ever said about the illness he was facing. He was an incredibly private man. Uh, he did not like the limelight. Did not like living in the limelight, as the Rush song says. And that's a blow, my friends. That is a blow to the drumming world, because he is an icon. There are few icons anymore. Like, legit, for real, icons. And Neil Peart was certainly one of those. And I was not a giant Rush fan, okay? It's not like I've lost my hero here. But I liked Rush. I just never really was at that level that some people get to. Like, I, I was lucky enough to see them on the Snakes and Arrows tour, which is 08 or 2010, whatever that was. Uh, they played the Bud locally, and I got third row for that gig, friends. Pretty cool, right? And when you go to a Rush show, what you'll see is traveling armies of Rush fans who are at all of the Rush shows. They'll go to 20 shows on a tour somehow. And they follow them all over the place. And I've seen minor glimpses of that sort of thing because uh, Sarah Smith, who I tour with, has that kind of a fan base in Europe in particular. And now it's a smaller fan base, okay? But there's a group of hardcore fans that follow Sarah around. And I get to watch that. And it's really cool. And thank you to those people. Rush has this army of folks that, who, who follow them around and they do meet and greets in every city. Fans, like hardcore, diehard Rush fans. 
I was not one of those, but I liked Rush, and I've come to appreciate Rush more and more the older I've gotten. But I got to tell you, man, seeing Neil Peart up close, we're talking third row here, so he is very, very close to me when I watch that show. It's hard to see Neil. His drum set is so big, and there's so many symbols that it's not really like you can see him. You can see his head back there with the little tam on, and you can kind of see the sticks rising and falling and that sort of thing. It's very, very difficult to see what he's doing, but just being that close to a player of that quality, it's not even quality. Neil Peart is singular. Neil Peart was singular, okay? There is no other Neil Peart. There may have been people who could play Neil Peart's parts. People had the technical ability to do that, I'm not one of them, but some people can. But the genius of Neil Peart was in the parts that he wrote. That's what separates Neil from everybody else. And you listen to those Rush songs, those parts were written with skill and with intention. And the thing that's really inspiring about Neil's playing is how intentional it was. And you listen to the composition, it's very rare especially in rock music, to talk about drummers and composition. He wrote parts. They were methodical, they were thought out, they were creative, they were technical, and they were bang on every time that dude played. He was an absolute perfectionist. And the other cool thing about Neil Peart is that the dude never rested on his laurels as a player. So he, he's coming through the 70s and 80s, and he's already Neil Peart. He's already recognized around the world as arguably the best rock drummer of all time. And that does not stop him, you know, 20 or 15 or whatever years into being Neil Peart from taking lessons. So he went to improve his craft already being at a level that almost nobody else was at. You know, and he he never stopped learning and he had this desire to learn and desire to improve. And if Neil Peart can say, I need to get better somehow, what does that mean for the rest of us? You know, I still take lessons with people because, I mean, I will never be a hundredth of the drummer that Neil Peart was. There are just certain people whose genius transcends. He is one of them. Now, he still had to work like mad to be that good and to make sacrifice. You know, he had, had to make a pile of sacrifices to do that and to tour with Rush and to be that. But, I mean, there's a level of talent there that is just beyond. He's singular. There are few people who have that level of genius, you know? But Neil never really influenced my playing, okay? Uh, Except beyond this idea of creating parts. And uh, that's something I think about a lot with the bit of recording that I do and, and songwriting that I get to contribute, which isn't a lot these days. But I was never really influenced by Neil Peart as a player. That did not mean that I did not respect him and that I did not like Rush. And seeing him up close is an education. And the thing is, when you see somebody at that level, up that close, it changes you. And, you know, if you're a guitar player, a bass player, a singer, whatever, any sort of a musician, go see players at the highest level and get up as close as you can because you will leave those shows a better player. I had this experience with Jason McGurr of Death Cab for Cutie, and he is one of my favorite drummers of all time. Top three. Just a a massively creative and skilled player. And another dude whose level I will never even come close to approaching. But I saw them play the same venue a few years ago, an arena show here in town, and we stood right up front, leaning on the security gates, right? the security barriers, and Jason McGurr was set up right over there, okay? And I got to watch him from whatever it was, 30 feet away. Now, Jason McGurr plays a much smaller kit, so you could actually see what was happening. I could see his hands. 
I could see the way he held his sticks. I could see his arm motions and the way he moved. And I left that show a better drummer than when I walked in. Just the way I carried myself, just the way I, uh, my posture on the kit was different from having watched Jason McGurr. You get that stuff by osmosis. You observe it. So whatever instrument you play, go watch people who play at the level that you would like to reach, even if in my case you have no hope of doing it. You know, go and watch those people. Get up close, and it will transform your playing. Like, pay close attention. Watch how they do things. Same thing with John Theodore of Queens of the Stone Age. I stood in what amounted to the pit for that band a couple years ago in town, and that's never a place I like to be, but, you know, okay. We were up front, and just being able to watch John Theodore play the drums, you learn things. You carry yourself differently, so do that! Anyways, I had a similar experience with Neil Peart, even though I couldn't see him as well. And I'm really glad that I got to see them, still at the peak of their powers, and I got to experience Neil Peart up close. Uh, the, the guy is an absolute legend. Where he has influenced me, I think, is not so much in drumming, but definitely as a writer. And we get all sorts of accolades right now, about Neil Peart the drummer, but people aren't talking as much about Neil Peart the writer. And for me, that was the primary influence. I haven't read a lot of his work, but he has one book that is among my favorites of all time, and that is Ghost Rider. Now, if you don't know Neil Peart's story, he lived a life of substantial pain, heartbreak, and tragedy. In the 90s, in the space of one year, his 19-year-old daughter was killed in a car accident, and within a year, his wife died. Uh, the diagnosis was cancer. Neil Peart would say she died of a broken heart. So this guy's life got turned upside down in the worst possible ways in the space of one year, and I cannot imagine. I can't even speculate as to what that experience was like. But what he did with it is he eventually wrote this book called Ghost Rider. And what happened was he, he withdrew from public life. He's always sort of been sheltered from public life. He, he never liked that. But he withdrew from everything that was Neil Peart. His wife died, he retired to his sort of house-slash-cabin in the woods in Quebec, set himself up as a hermit, and grieved and questioned whether he wanted to stay alive. And I can imagine that's what you would do. He quit playing the drums, he no longer wanted anything to do with Rush or music or anything. These things seemed like an abomination to his misery, you know, doing any of that, being that person anymore. He was not that person anymore. And I think he reached a point where he had become so isolated uh, that he feared for himself. And so what he did was he decided to get on his motorcycle. He was a massive motorcycle enthusiast and he had ridden all over the world. He decided to load up his gear on his motorcycle and simply ride. Locked up his house, put on his helmet, put on his gear, and just rode. And he did not know really where he was going or for how long he would be gone. And uh, that's kind of a romantic notion for some of us who kind of fantasize about just getting on the highway and driving away from it all. But for him, it became a survival necessity. And so he leaves his whole world behind. He is no longer Neil Peart. He is no longer arguably the greatest drummer in the world. He is no longer a rock star in a revered band. Instead, he's just a masked man on a motorcycle. Anonymous, there and gone, stripped down to the raw core, trying to reconstitute himself, 
trying to figure out if he even wants to reconstitute himself. And he calls this persona the Ghost Rider. And this is such a powerful book. You know, 9.5 times out of 10, when a celebrity releases a book, it's got the celebrity's name on it. Somebody else wrote the thing, okay? Or at least helped write the thing. This is all Neil Peart. He was a Renaissance man. He liked art, and he was a writer and a musician, and he liked uh, good whiskey. I don't know if he quit drinking at a certain point, but he liked the finer things, Neil Peart, and he liked art. And this book, Ghost Rider, is so powerful. It reads like a novel, even though it's, it's his real experience. And I'm going to read from it right now, gentle listener, for you. And my temptation is to read the ending, because the ending is so profound and sad and hopeful at the same time. It's, um, it's a really a wonderful piece of literature. I'm, I'm recommending that you read Ghost Rider by Neil Peart. I'm going to read from it right now. This is very, very early on. This is 10 pages in. And he says, I didn't really have a reason to carry on. I had no interest in life, work, or the world beyond. But unlike Jackie, that's his wife, who had surely willed her death, I seemed to be armored with some kind of survival instinct, some inner reflex that held to the conviction that something will come up. Because of some strength or flaw of character, I never seemed to question why I should survive, but only how, though that was certainly a big enough question to deal with at the time. I remember thinking, how does anyone survive something like this? And if they do, what kind of person comes out the other end? I didn't know, but throughout that dark time of grief, sorrow, desolation, and complete despair, something in me seemed determined to carry on something would come up. Or maybe it was more like the Mormon woman's statement, quote, the only reason I'm alive is because I could not die. Skipping ahead to the next page. When I allowed myself to consider turning back, the thought that kept me riding on was, then what? For over a month, I had tried living there alone, with occasional visits from friends to help take me out of myself, and I had still felt myself beginning to slip into a deep, dark hole. Various stimulants and depressants could help me get through the days and nights, but as I had recently written to a friend, that's okay for a temporary escape hatch, but it's no kind of life. I had tried the hermit mode, now it was time to try the gypsy mode. I tried not to think of what I would do if that didn't work. I love the book because it's got such vibe, such mood and such atmosphere. And he he was a really terrific writer. Uh, And I certainly appreciate that as a writer and a drummer. And I've always found a kind of healing in motion. And that's the subtitle to the book, uh, Journeys on the Healing Road, or whatever it's called. And uh, the healing road is, is a thing. Motion is a thing. Movement is a thing. And I've found that too. And I've actually, some of the stuff that I've written that's unpublished and will remain unpublished is about that sort of thing. It tends to end with people walking away from it all. And that's a, that's a powerful thing to do to walk away from it and to have motion, have motion in your life. I think a lot of people who are suffering, who are in pain, tend to become stationary. There's a certain peculiar magic in motion. It doesn't even necessarily have to be physical motion, just motion in some direction. So, you know, if you're one of the people who's struggling with something, who's suffering with loss, who's in pain, maybe some motion is required. And if you won't take it from me, uh, take it from Neil Peart and take it from his book, uh, The Ghost Rider. It is a wonderful, wonderful piece of literature. And I very highly recommend it. And the ending is really, really powerful. So 
Read the Ghost Rider. I have a fun story about Ghost Rider. I read it for the first time, I don't know how many years ago. I was on a beach in Mexico, lucky enough to be relaxing in the sun, and I always take books with me to read. Ghost Rider I took one year, and I was absolutely absorbed in it. I could not put it down. There have been two memoirs that have done that to me, by the way. One is Ghost Rider. The other is Open by Andre Agassi. Now, you don't have to be a tennis fan to appreciate that book. It is absolutely marvelous. Another one that you can't put down, and it was co-written with a guy named J.R. Moringer, 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 whose own memoir, The Tender Bar, is one of the great memoirs I've read as well. Moringer is a freaking fabulous writer. And Agassiz's book is a, is a can't-put-it-downer. I picked it up recently, walking through Chapters Indigo on my way to the Starbucks, and I happened to see it on a, like a reduced shelf, and I just picked it up and opened it up to a page and started reading, and I found myself standing there for I don't know how long just reading. I could not put the thing down. So read Open by Andre Agassi if you want a smashing read, and read The Tender Bar by J.R. Moringer if you want another smashing read. And if you want a third smashing read, back to Ghost Rider. So I was reading this book on the beach in Mexico. Fine. And I got up to play beach soccer with the people and was reminded that I've let myself get into horrendous cardiovascular condition. But that's not the point. And after the beach soccer game was done, I was walking back through the white sand and the rows of blue beach chairs and the tiki huts on the beach, people with pina coladas and the sound of Latin music playing up by the pool. And I saw this girl, a spectacular looking girl with sunglasses and tattoos, and she said something to me in passing about how was the soccer or something like that. We struck up a conversation first about soccer and then about her tattoos, and she was reading something and she, we somehow wound up talking about what I was reading, Ghost Rider by Neil Peart. Do you know who Neil Peart is? Yes, I do, she said. Her name is Allison. She's from Pennsylvania. She's great. And she was there with her partner, and they were having a good time. And so we talked about this book and um, how much I was enjoying it and how powerful it was, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, she thought it would be nice to read it sometime, which is great. And then off we went. And then a day or two later, I was on the beach reading, and I finished The Ghost Rider, that last page that I just read before, I just read it again before I came on here, debating whether I was going to read it to you, gentle listener, but that feels like a spoiler, so I'm not gonna. But I read it again, because it's just so powerful. And when I was finished reading it the first time on the beach, I sort of closed the book, I let it sit in my lap, and I looked out over the water. And I felt the breeze blow across me, and I listened to the sounds, and it's just kind of a a soul-stirring passage at the end. Very sad, but again, very hopeful. It's not easy to do that, but Neil Peart did it. And I happened to spy Allison sitting on the beach a little further down. And I had this intuition, I had this impulse that said, go give Allison the book. So I picked up the book and I got up out of my chair and I walked over and I handed it to her. And that's the last I saw of my Ghost Rider book. The good thing is, I remain friends with Allison. So, hey, Ghost Rider brings people together. And uh, I don't know if Allison listens to the show, but I have that memory and I hope you're doing well. She's really cool. Now, my friend Mark happened to have a PDF of Ghost Rider, and when I knew I was going to talk about it, I got him to send it to me, so I've been reading through the book again, and once again, I can't put the thing down. It's part travelogue, and it's almost like a novel, and it's this story of grief and heartache and healing on the road, reconstituting yourself, building yourself up from the very, very raw core, which sometimes in life you're required to do. Neil Peart was. He wrote a wonderful book about it. And so I recommend that you go and pick up Ghost Rider by Neil Peart and read it. And when you're done reading it, give it to a stranger. Pass it along. Pass the literature along, kids. Uh, We need it these days because 2020 
thanks in no small part to the death of Neil Peart, has started off pretty rough, has it not? So keep the faith, read good books, read inspiring books, and read Ghost Rider. Now this brings me to the next thing on this solo sode. Because a lot of people, after Neil Peart died, uh, you know, you're hearing a lot of Rush out there these days. And a lot of people are going back and um, going over some older, older Rush music maybe that they haven't listened to in a long time. And that's good and necessary and vital. And it brings me to this idea about the music of your youth. Do you remember the music of your youth, kids? The music you used to listen to when you were a kid or a teenager? I had a profound experience on the road, I don't know, four or five years ago. I was in the midst of a long tour out west. And, you know, even even good tours grind you down after a while. And sometimes you need a bit of solitude. And sometimes you're just tired Maybe there have been a couple of gigs that weren't that great, especially at my level when you can't always count on there being an audience, you know. Touring does that. It grinds you down after a while. And I remember being in the gym. I think I was in Victoria, British Columbia. And feeling a bit dark. And I had with me my iPod. Remember iPods? I still have my iPod. And a lot of the same music is still on it. What I had it loaded up with in those days was some hair metal, because I grew up on the hair metal, and you know, there was a time when I felt a certain stigma attached to that, but the older I've gotten, the more I let my freak flag fly, and I gotta tell you, I like the hair metal. I grew up on it, it's the music of my youth, and there is no comfort That is better than the music of your youth, kids, whether that was Rush that you stopped listening to and now you go back because it's Neil Peart. In my case, I was in the gym and I put on some Jackal and I put on some Cinderella and I put on some Tesla and felt really good, you know? It feels good to listen to the music that you grew up on. Brings back memories and it brings back a certain comfort. So, if you're one of those people out there right now that's unsettled by 2020, or just having trouble in life, or just not super happy right now, go put on the music of your youth. I had this experience recently. Uh, I grew up, as I've said before, in the evangelical Christian world. So, a lot of the music of my youth was. by the rest of the world's standards, pretty obscure and unheard before. Um, I wasn't really allowed to have secular music in my home. Secular meaning non-Christian music. Now, being the intrepid and enterprising teenager I was, I managed to sneak in some contraband from time to time. And uh, hope nobody punishes me now for that, but it's true. But anyways, a lot of the music I grew up listening to was Christian rock music. I've talked about this on Rotisodes with my boy Denny Goche and the great Ken the Zen Ross. So a lot of music that probably you've never heard before, but uh, it was the music that the youth group kids were listening to. And one of the bands that, um, one record in particular was by this band called Rez Band. Anybody know Rez Band? Rez is short for Resurrection Band, and I feel like they made a very smart, marketing decision, changing that to just res. (laughs) And they put out a record in 1985 called Between Heaven and Hell. And res was, okay, a lot of the music from that world was pretty goofy, okay? And a lot of it was very inferior to the secular counterpoint. And a lot of the lyrics were kind of silly. And a lot of it wasn't great. And I will freely admit that now. Res Band, however, was one of the bands from that era that actually had a thing, and they didn't write about a lot of the goofy stuff. They were an inner-city Chicago band, very involved in the actual Christian principles of caring for the sick and the poor. Uh, They were very socially conscious, very involved in a rough part of America, and their songs reflected that, and they were... On this record in particular, kind of an odd mix of like hard new wave and blues rock, Uh, but it worked for them. I don't know. Somehow it worked. 
uh, hard rock record by a hard rocking band. And the leader of that band is a dude called Glenn Kaiser, Pastor Glenn Kaiser. And um, dude is a legit blues singer, blues player. And that came through in particular in that Between Heaven and Hell record. And I've had it in the back of my head. It's been rolling in the back of my head for the last little while. Hey, go listen to a couple of songs off that Rez record. So I did that recently, okay? I was playing the drums downstairs, doing my regular practice, and then it popped into my head again. Hey, dude, Rez, Between Heaven and Hell. So I went there on the YouTube where you can find everything. It's all out there, man. And... I pulled up a couple of tracks from that record. Now, the song that I wanted to hear was 2000. It's the last song on the album, and it's a projection to the year 2000, which seems really quaint now that we've rolled over 2020, but this is 1985, so it's a projection to the year 2000, and it's about all sorts of cool stuff. It's just got a really dark vibe, kind of vibe, kind of a chugging thing. It was one of my favorite songs in the album, and I played along to that, and it was great. And I played it along to another song called Zout Afrikan, which is a really cool song. And this ballad about suicide called Shadows. Not super uplifting, but, you know, it's the music of my youth. And it felt really good, man. So I recommend you do that. If you need a little pick-me-up, if you're feeling a bit nostalgic, go back and listen to whatever it was you used to listen to that Air Supply record, or that Super Tramp record, or that Guns N' Roses record, you know? Whatever it was that you listened to when you were a kid that you haven't listened to in a very long time, go back and listen to it, and I think you will feel really good if you do. The interesting thing about the Rez record, I've never actually played along to it before, but I was playing it, and the parts were coming out of me, more or less. You know, I haven't listened to some of those songs in, I don't know, what, 30 years probably? And it's interesting how immediate it is. I've had this experience before. I put on a Queensryche record last year at one point. I was a, I was a big Queensryche fan, as you know, a lot of the kids were back in the late 80s, because Queensryche is a killer band. And it continues to frustrate me that the hair metal stuff is so shunned. Uh, you, know, you rarely hear any of it on classic rock radio, a bit of Guns N' Roses, the occasional Poison song, a lot of Def Leppard and maybe Motley Crue, but you had bands like Queensryche and bands like Tesla that were legit, legit, and they get lumped into this. They were hair metal, dude. Those those guys could play, those guys could sing, those guys could write, and it's frustrating to me that classic rock radio goes from about 1982 journey. And then now it jumps up to 1993 Nirvana with the occasional Def Leppard or Metallica song in the middle. It's lame. That was wonderful music, a lot of it. Now, some of it was goofy. Some of Grunge was goofy too, by the way. Anyways, nobody listens to that music. But I put on the Queensryche's Empire album, right? And just played along with it. Scott Rockenfeld, terrific drummer, terrific band, terrific album, man. Jet City Woman, right? Do you remember that? Do you remember Jet City Woman? Silent Lucidity? Come on, folks. You know. You can admit it. You liked that Queensryche record. And their Operation Mindcrime album, by the way, is one of the great rock records of all time. Anyhow, it's funny how this comes back to you, because I hadn't never really played along to Empire either, and I hadn't listened to it in a long time, and I put it on, and all of a sudden these parts are coming out of me. I don't play as well as Scott Rockenfeld. I, I certainly don't play those songs as well as he did, because he wrote those parts and he played them. But it's interesting what comes out of you, these memories that come out of you, musical memories, you know? It's cool what you remember. It's like, have you ever been driving down the road and a song came on from 30 years ago that you used to listen to, and all of a sudden you know all of the words to it? That's a bizarre thing, but it's true. These things that get locked in your memory, and sometimes you can unlock them. So go put on the music of your youth. Go and enjoy it. Go and indulge a bit of nostalgia, and I think you'll feel good, and I think you'll feel powerful. I certainly felt powerful, you know, out there on the road and I got uh, I Stand Alone or uh, When Will It Rain by Jackal coming on the headphones. I'm like, this, this is my jam. This is my music. This feels good. So those of you who are putting yourself out there and the come down is happening, right? 
and it's pulling you back in and it's making you fearful. Draw strength from the music of your youth, kids. Go back to that. Feel that comfort. It's a nice sort of companion to the fear you may be feeling as you're stepping out there. And people are stepping out there. I've gotten a couple of messages from people who are doing courageous things all of a sudden, inspired partially uh, by some of the things that I've said on the solo sodes. And um, while that, that's terrific, good for you. Go out there, do your thing, do it smart. But, uh, you know, I feel a certain amount of responsibility, although I shouldn't. Everyone's an adult and they can make their own decisions. I'm just saying good things happen when you put yourself out there. So kudos to those of you who are. I have somehow managed to make it 40 plus minutes through this, despite an animal in my wall and despite the come down and despite the fear. So I guess we've made it to the end of another one, kids. We did it somehow. And uh, I hope you made it this far with me. You know, I'm just looking through my notes. Anything I missed that I might want to say. Kudos to all you people who are out there trying things. Somebody's going to an open mic for the first time. Somebody else quit a job. I will not be held responsible for that, but good for you. And, uh, yeah, that's it. That's all I wanted to say today. And uh, I hope Allison's listening. I hope uh, you're having a wonderful time wherever you are in the world. Up here in Canada, this part of Canada, there is still no snow on the ground, and that's just great by me. I'm getting ready to go on the road soon, so I got some practicing to do. And I'm going to be back absolutely with an interview in the next podcast. That interview is done. So if you're sick of listening to me, you can listen to somebody smarter and uh, wiser and more interesting than me. And if you've hung with me this far, I want you to know I super duper appreciate it. I hope you're getting something out of these episodes. And if you are, please drop me a line and let me know. And if there's stuff that you want me to expand on or talk about, drop me a line and tell me that too. Otherwise, put yourself out there. Go listen to the music of your youth. Uh, check out Res Band if you want something a little bit different between heaven and hell. Check out Queensryche's Empire album. And, you know... I used to ask people, what are you most excited about right now? My answer to that so far this year has been the forthcoming King's X record. Also, new Sarah Harmer. If you know Sarah Harmer, tell her I want to play with her. Even though she's got an army of people who can already play with her. And uh, she's dropped two singles from her forthcoming record. It's been a long time since Sarah Harmer put out a record, and I've been patiently waiting She's released two singles. They're both terrific. Go look them up. Go look up Sarah Harmer. Catch her on her forthcoming Canadian tour. Check out the new King's X record whenever it gets dropped. We're still patiently awaiting that. And hey, if you got music I should check out, send me a line and tell me that too. But I'm going to stop rambling. We're going off the tracks here. I'm going to get ready because i got to do a drum lesson. And I'll be back sometime in the very near future. Until then... Have a good time, folks. Smile, love each other, say hello, give hugs, and I'll talk to you on the next one. Bye for now. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to know more about the show and my guests, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at J-W underscore Huff. No matter where you listen to the show, it would help me out a great deal if you would leave a rating and review preferably a positive one. And if you like these episodes, please do me the favor of sharing them with your friends, which is always much appreciated. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you, and remember, good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now.
You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips.